Good morning or good afternoon. My name is Roger Cam. I'm from MIT and I'm in the biological and mechanical engineering departments. I'd like to describe some of the work that we've been doing recently in microphysiological systems, specifically in the context of neurological disease. So to me, a microphysiological system uh, has these attributes. It would in some way recapitulate real organ form and function. Most of our work and, and a lot of the mo and most of the microphysiological systems are based on microfluidic technology that's been developed over the past 15 years or so. Um, most in many cases they should involve 3D culture, um, often multiple different organ types or cell types. And, and a lot of the models are patient specific. So for example, we do a lot of work in cancer and we get biopsy specimens and, and then we use patient uh, derived IPS cells as well. I wouldn't say that these are high throughput systems, but they are relatively, they can be put onto platforms that have say 40 experiments on, on a 384 well uh, platform. And most of the experiments that I'm gonna, or most of the platforms that I'm gonna describe today are amenable to uh, uh, translation into that level of uh, throughput. Um, our focus has been largely on developing vascularized systems. Uh, most of what I talk about will have vascular networks and be perfusible, except for the last one that I that uh, at the end of my talk. And then finally, in terms of applications, I, I think this audience knows that uh, these could be used as disease models. They could be used in terms of um, uh, developing new approaches to, to therapy or for drug screening. By way of disclosure, I'm a co-founder of AIM Biotech, and a lot of the platforms that I'm going to describe today are basically of the design that you see up in the le upper left-hand corner. Um, the, the pink region corresponds to a region where the, the gel can be inserted, injected into the system, um, and that, that could contain various cell types. The aqua and blue channels correspond to regions where we have media access. Um, there are variations on the design that I'm going to show you today, but uh, the basic concepts are here. And when we inject the gel, it's just constrained into that central gel region by these posts uh, by surface tension pinning. Uh, here's another variation on the design, uh, which we use more generally for organoid systems where we again we have the two media channels we have a region uh, a gel region which is in the center and then the, the a hole in the in the central region where we can insert either a, a different set of cells or an organoid so these systems have uh, a variety of advantages and capabilities we can image using a variety of different imaging techniques we can sample the media at any uh, time point during the experiment uh, going through one of the, the filling ports uh, in the devices and with that sampled media we can do any of the typical biochemical or omic analyses that you'd like to do and then we can also do functional ass assays so I'll talk a lot about uh, permeability measurements in the vascular networks we can also look at cell migration uh, and other uh, characteristics that occur during um, normal disease processes. I'm going to quickly go through a couple of movies just to give you an idea, just to orient you in terms of um, the, the vascular networks that we develop and how we can use those. Again, uh, all of these are being done in a device of the type that you see here. Um, the first video that I show is going to be of the development of the vascular structures by self-assembly. So we simply mix the endothelial cells and oftentimes fibroblasts in with the gel solution. We inject it into the central pink region of the device. And then over a period of about 24 to 48 hours, these form into networks that eventually uh, can uh, become perfusible. In the lower left, uh, I'm not going to show this video, but in this case, what we've done is we've taken tumor cells that, you, that are shown in green here, and we flow these into, in the media, into the microvascular networks, uh, where they can become stuck, they, they become activated, 
and then they can transmigrate out of the vasculature into the surrounding tissue space, with the, which is a gel matrix. Um, the other two I'm going to go through, so let me just start with the movies. So this first one is the formation. Uh, with or without immune cells for uh, at least a week and probably more. This is just to, to give you some idea of the kind of um, uh, fluorescent microscopy that we opens up a gap between two neighboring Uh, and this process generally takes about four hours. In this case, what we've done of the vascular network from one of our devices. That the image from the vas from uh, the microvascular network shows in uh, uh, in blue here because we stained uh, collagen type four. But you can see they have the morphology that that uh, uh, is very similar to what you see in vivo. And by regulating not just the trans the the channel to channel pressure, which allows us to regulate the intravascular flow, we can also regulate the pressure difference between inside the vessel and the surrounding tissue space. Uh, that allows us to control the transmural flow. Just to give you some idea of what the vascular wall looks like, here's one tight junction uh, with a higher magnification up in the corner. Uh, showing uh, a very tight junction between the two endothelial cells, giving rise to low permeability. It's a, uh, uh, almost at the level of the blood-brain barrier in this case. And here we can also um, take, these are EM images, obviously. We can look at uh, transport by, ve by vesicles across the endothelial barrier. And some of this work has recently been published. In this slide, um, I'm going to talk about the measurements of vascular permeability that we can make. Um, and here what we've done is generated our three-dimensional network, and we've compared the results of that uh, using the same cells, but in a transwell system, which is what um, I think many of you probably are used to using. When you measure the permeability, or the, the leakiness of the, of the vasculature, of the endothelium, uh, as a function of molecular weight, uh, with our 3D system, we get the results that are shown in the solid green symbols, 
which agree very well with the in vivo measurements, which are the open green symbols here. With the same cells in a 2D system, we get the solid orange symbols, uh, and other 2D systems are shown in the open symbols. So you can see there can be one to two orders of magnitude difference in the permeability. That's with no transmural flow. If we generate a transmural flow, then the apparent permeability goes up with the pressure difference between the uh, inside the vessel and outside the vessel. Um, we can do that with various, size, various molecular weight uh, dextrans, for example. And from these data, we can back out what the hydraulic conductivity is and also the reflection coefficient of the vasculature. And again, the green symbols are the measurements here corresponding closely with the animal measurements and somewhat lower than most of the 2D measurements. Uh, reflection coefficients are what you'd expect going from a, a small protein, 4 kilodalton dextran, up to 150 kilodalton dextran. Uh, the reflection coefficients approach about 1. We can also make measurements even if the uh, molecule of interest is non-fluorescent. Um, in this case, what we've done is we collected media from the tissue port, uh, from the gel port, and, and analyzed it then uh, using ELISA, and then compared that to the measurements that we make with a fluorescent version of the same molecule. And you can see that both for albumin and IgG, we're getting um, uh, normalized concentration ratios. This is concentration intravascular divided by the, uh, I'm sorry, concentration outside the vessel divided by concentration inside the vessel uh, for the two different proteins. Also, interestingly, if you look at the permeability, the apparent permeability for these two molecules, what you find is that unlike the dextran, these are pressure independent, suggesting that these are both actively transported. Uh, as we know that they are, both albumin and IgG. Uh, and so most of them are being transported through the cell. We've also looked at the uh, transport of, of, in this case, two monoclonal antibodies and two small molecule therapeutics. And again, the concentration ratios are pretty much what, what you'd expect to see. And they're consistent with uh, um, measurements that uh, we've confirmed with, with our sponsors of this work, with, uh, which is Amgen. So I'm going to move on to the blood-brain barrier. Uh, these are just the different pathways that um, molecules use to get across the endothelium. Um, but the three different cell types that are present in the blood-brain barrier are shown here. The endothelial cells, the pericytes, and the astrocytes. Uh, the astrocyte end feet, which come in contact with the vessels. And you can see we can either get transcellular exchange or we can get pericellular exchange. The model that we generated is, is shown here. What we use is um, human IPS-derived endothelial cells, but then primary human brain pericytes and pr primary brain astrocytes. And what we do is we mix these three cell types up into um, a fibrin gel solution, which we inject into the central region of the microfluidic device. And then these cells self-assemble into the, the, the structures that, that you observe in the in vivo brain, uh, here's one image that shows that structure. The green are the vascular structures and the, and the pink are the astrocytes in this case. Uh, we don't see the pericytes because they're not fluorescent. When we take that system and we measure the permeability, what we find is that um, the, the co-culture with pericytes or with astrocytes uh, gives rise to a progressive reduction in the permeability of the vascular networks which is what we'd expect to find in the brain. In fact, the, the, both the brain pericytes and astrocytes are, are instrumental in terms of uh, generating low permeabilities that in our model system uh, become comparable to then what you see in vivo. Here are just a couple of, of electron, uh, microgra electron micrographs of um, the vessels. Again, here showing um, what we occasionally see, even in our in, our in vitro systems, is a seamless endothelial cell junction, suggesting that these are extremely tight. Uh, we can also, just using false colors, we can look at interactions between astrocytes and the endothelial cell. 
uh, or in this case, the three cell types, the astrocyte in pink, um, the pericyte in red, and the endothelial cell in green. These images, by the way, were produced by Olga Morozova at Harvard University uh, in collaboration again with Amgen. So we're interested in seeing um, what was giving rise to the tightness, the low permeability of our BPP model. So we looked at several different proteins. Uh, the first three rows here are tight junctional proteins, and the last two are, are um, basement membrane proteins. Um, so this is just immunohistochemical staining. So you can see, at least qualitatively, that as you go from a monoculture to a co-culture to a triculture system, you get progressive higher level, progressively higher levels of, of expression of these tight junction proteins, and also of several basement membrane proteins. We did a more extensive analysis using RT-PCR. Uh, this is for all the cells uh, collectively in the system. So in other words, it includes the endothelial cells, the pericytes, and the astrocytes. But you can see it gives you some idea um, how as you go progressively in time from day zero up to day seven, we get a progressive increase in the expression level of these three tight junction proteins, the ones indicated by green, um, but also an increase, relative increase, when we compare the monoculture system to the co-culture and the triculture system. Um, some of these other proteins, uh, the genes that I've highlighted in red here, are of interest because they happen to be transporter proteins that tend to be upregulated in the brain BBB. Um, we went back and we redid some, some of the RT-PCR data. Uh, this time we separated out the endothelial cells so that we could look exclusively at the expression levels in those. So again, we're looking at the tight junction or adherence junction proteins. Those are the ones in the first group. And you can see again, uh, here we're comparing, for example, the so these are the tight junction proteins on the top and the transporter proteins on the bottom. If we look, for example, comparing uh, the, these are human brain microvascular endothelial cells, um, everything is normalized to the 2D culture. We, if we put these in 3D, you can see that the expression levels change significantly. We can also show that if we compare the IPS cells as well. In the 2D culture, uh, most of these proteins are expressed at relatively low levels, but then as we go to the 3 key, 3D uh, co-culture system, uh, a lot of these proteins become more highly regulated. Notice that this is on a log scale, so we're talking about very large changes. And then finally, we can also look at the comparison then between the, the primary human um, microvascular cells from the brain and the IPS-derived endothelial cells. And what you see is a very similar expression pattern. And, and in fact, in, in some cases, the, uh, the tight junction proteins are even more highly expressed uh, in the IPS cells uh, once they're able to, to signal with the uh, brain pericytes and astrocytes. So why do we want to generate the blood-brain barrier? And aside from looking at the transport across the barrier, we're also interested in looking at the um, metastasis of breast cancer, for example, in this case, to, to the brain. So here again, we generate our, our blood-brain barrier model. We introduce the cancer cells into the system, and then we observe their extravasation. And this is just one sample of the results. We've taken re, uh, MDA, MB231 cells. It's a triple negative breast cancer cell line, uh, either the parental cell line or cell, a subpopulation of these cells that preferentially metastasized to, to lung, the LM cells, or the preferentially metastasized to brain, the BRM cells. And what we show here is that um, consistent with the, the fact that these cells were isolated in mice, we see a higher ex uh, extravasation rate. This is the percentage of cells that extravasate across the BBB during a 24-hour period. It's higher when we have the astrocytes present relative to when we have either the IPS alone or the IPS and PCs. We took that one step further. Uh, we looked at different cancer cell types. Here we looked, uh, this is the breast cancer cell we were just looking at. 
Uh, if we look at A549s, which is lung cancer cell line or the prostate carcinoma cell line, uh, we find that uh, similar patterns of behavior where uh, despite the fact that the cell, that the um, BBB has a lower permeability and has tighter junctions than, than the other cell types present or than, than other vascular networks, uh, we get higher levels of extravasation into the surrounding tissue. Uh, we wanted to find out what factors were being secreted by the cells. It looked like there was something that was selectively secreted by the astrocytes that was influencing the rate of extravasation. So we did a cytokine array and we identified a, a few um, cytokines that were upregulated in the uh, co-culture system, astrocytes and, and the cancer cells. But one in particular was CCL2, which was upregulated five-fold higher compared to the endothelial cells and the tumor cells alone. So we focused on that, and we first of all looked at uh, taking just our monoculture system, the vascular networks derived just from the iPS-derived DCs, or the co-culture system where we add the pericytes, and then we added recombinant CCL2. And what you see here is that as we add an increasing level, we get an increase in the extravasation rate in both cases. We could also do the opposite experiment. We could take the triculture system, uh, including the, the astrocytes, and as we block then, uh, introduce an a blocking antibody for CCL2, we got a progressive reduction in the extravasation rates. And I'm not going to be able to show these results, but we've also looked at the molecule that the Masagi lab had identified as being partially responsible for the increased extravasation rates to the brain. When we block that as well, we get even further reductions in our in vitro model. So the in vitro model seems to be able to recapitulate a, a lot of the types of behavior that we see only in mouse models otherwise. I'm going to move on to a different model. This is a, a model, monolayer model looking at the interactions between the vascular network and uh, and Alzheimer, Alzheimer's disease neurons. Uh, this is a, just a schematic on the left-hand side showing the regions where we introduce, uh, in one case, on the left-hand gel region. Let me start from the left. There's a media channel, first of all, on the far left. The next channel is one where we, we introduce the um, uh, genetically modified uh, ES cells that are uh, engineered so that they overexpress either A beta 40 or 42. Then there's an empty gel region, and then there's a channel that contains the endothelial monolayer. And what we're looking at here is how the A beta that's secreted by the neurons diffuses through the collagen barrier, interacts with the endothelium, and then impacts that, the function of that barrier. So here are some of the results. We're looking at permeability first. Uh, for two different size uh, dextrans, and you can see that the uh, cells that overexpress the A beta 40 or 42, that's with AD, have a higher permeability, in other words, they're leakier than the wild type cells uh, for both molecules. And also, we, we can now start to demonstrate that because of that increased leakiness of the vascular barrier, uh, if we add thrombin to the vasculature, uh, that gives rise to a high rate of death uh, in the neurons, uh, especially in the AD cells relative to the wild type, even without thrombin, although we get some uh, death of the Alzheimer's cells. We also wanted to see how the A beta was affecting the endothelial monolayers, so we looked at um, both uh, gene expression of these different tight junction proteins. Um, it also looked at it by, at, uh, by uh, histochem histochemical, by histochemistry analysis. Uh, we could identify, for example, um, in some cases, the A beta 40 or 42 actually accumulating on the outside surface. This is the endothelial monolayer shown on the right-hand side, and the green corresponds to the A beta. This is our more recent model. Uh, where we're combining the BBB, the blood-brain barrier vasculature, which is shown here in green, with a central region where we can introduce the REN cells, the, the AD-modified cells that overexpress A-beta. 
um, to, to produce a more realistic model. And here you can see that the vasculature actually uh, comes up very close to the neurons and, and we get be much better exchange. That's a model that's just under development. Uh, finally, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about um, a model that we've uh, developed a number of years back and then have been further developing with the help of Biogen. Um, and in this case, uh, we are looking at a 3D human motor neuron uh, system, um, a, a motor unit on a chip. Uh, this just shows the chip in schematic form. Uh, there are four experiments on one of these chips. Uh, the, the works are shown here, where on the right-hand side, we can introduce uh, uh, IPS-derived uh, skeletal muscle cells that form around posts. Uh, separately, we differentiate the endothelial cells, I'm sorry, the neuron, the motor neurons, and then we can insert them over on the left-hand side. <clears throat> this shows it, uh, the process a little bit more schematically. We first introduce the muscle cells. They coalesce around these posts. Uh, then uh, once the motor neurons are differentiated, we can insert them in, in a collagen gel over on the left-hand side. And then over the course of about these motor neurons ex extend neurites and they penetrate into the muscle and they innervate it. I should mention that all the cells are either I IPS or ES derived, and they're also all modified to become op to be optogenetic. So all we have to do is shine a light on these motor neurons on the left hand side, and then they can activate the muscle, and we can see muscle contraction. <clears throat> With the muscle contraction, because the posts are actually flexible, we can, we can back out what the force of contraction is under these different conditions. And this is what the motor unit looks like. The motor neurons are on the left-hand side. Uh, the blue is DAPI, the green shows the, the neurites, and then the red on the right-hand side is the muscle. Uh, in these images, the first image on the left is a single slice and a confocal image. Uh, these are all at day 14 of the co-culture. And you can see the neurites extending into the muscle and then forming uh, the neuromuscular junctions. And we know that the junctions are made because we can activate the neurons either using uh, glutamic acid or optogenetically, and we get muscle contraction, which we can use then again as a means of measuring the force. This shows what happens. The, the blue image in the upper right-hand corner means the light is being shown on the neurons. <clears throat> and as I say from that, we can measure the force. We've looked at this in terms of drug screening. We've just uh, proof of principle, we took two drugs, basudinib and rapamycin. Uh, both of which act to increase autophagy that are in either phase one or phase two clinical trial. Here in the first graph, we're looking at the force of contraction of the muscle. The muscle, I should, I should point out, is the same in both the ALS and the healthy systems. Only the motor neurons are derived from an ALS patient. Uh, despite that, what we find is that the muscle contractile force um, in the far right here on day 14, the light gray box corresponds to the healthy motor unit. The black box corresponds to the ALS motor unit. So you can see there's a, already a loss of function in the muscle, which is recovered partly by the use of the, the one or both drugs. We can also look at it, at it in terms of the morphology of the system that you see on the left here, and then also in terms of the, the uh, cell death. Uh, in, the, in the muscle cluster, uh, which is very low in the healthy system, is quite high with ALS, but then gets recovered again through the therapies, suggesting that this, this platform could be used for drug screening. So with that, I'd like to end, but I need to acknowledge um, certainly all my collaborators. Uh, the postdoctoral researchers or visiting scientists that did the work that, uh, that I just presented uh, especially um, Giovanni Ofadu and Tetsuya Osaki and Eugene Shin, uh, all postdocs in my lab who did most of the, the neurological work, uh, and graduate students. Uh, Marco Campisi was instrumental in developing the blood-brain barrier model, as was Cynthia Hajal. 
uh, our different fun, uh, sources of funding, uh, and the rest of my lab. Thank you very much, uh, and I look forward to seeing the questions that you have.